they you know where they are and so forth. Um, Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, hope you've uh, gotten your caffeine boost. Um, we've got 40 minutes for the Q&A session. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of interesting questions. Please identify yourself when the microphone is given to you. Kindly make your questions as short as possible. And um, I know, I expect this to be a, a pretty interesting and heated debate, but Let's try and have respect for each other during this conversation. I think that's really important. Um, since I am the chair, I will take the privilege of asking the first question. And um, I'd like to ask this to Professor Kied. Um, as you are leaving the IGC now, I'm interested to know what has been your biggest achievement and what do you think has been the most frustrating part of your work? I, th I think it's relatively simple from what I've said. Um, leaving behind an organization that uh, is going to change the structure um, together with the new people in the Exco is probably the, the, the biggest achievement. Um, the disappointment maybe is that I overestimated um, the will of change with many people and um, uh, it just takes much more time to actually achieve this. And I didn't know, of course, that there was going to be resistance. I was astonished, though, how blunt and blatant this was expressed, especially in the last part, in particular by some of these Southern European uh, exponents. All right, so I will take questions, and we have one. Um, I'll take one from Bonita, the lady over here. Thank you, Benita Merciades from Australia. Um, and I have to say, as someone of Southern European background um, and someone who lives in a, a country with some fairly good liberal democratic principles, I don't think it's quite um, confined to, to countries from Southern Europe that would have resistance. And I give as an instance the elephant in the room, I think, of anything to do with FIFA, and that's development funding. It was the it's the elephant in the room in terms of what's happened over the past 35 years, not just since the mid-1990s. And there's also the elephant in the room of the World Cup bids. And I give as an example, um, for instance, the chairman of a football association from a first world nation who uh, is the senior ex and a senior executive of BP, who, when asked if he would actually stand up to FIFA back in 2011 and demand some reform, his response was, no, I'm not going to oppose Mr Blatter because he gives us lots of money. Now, that money isn't Mr Blatter's money, as you made the point. Um, it's FIFA's money, and it's actually money that belongs to the game. But it has been used over at least 35 years to curry favour. And that gets back to your point about changing culture. How are you going, how will culture, I, I don't have any confidence as a lifetime football fan of Southern European extraction brought up in Australia that anything's going to change in FIFA. Um, culture won't change unless there is complete <laughs> reform along the lines that Roger put forward. Who is this going to be addressed to? I would be very interested in anyone's comments, but particularly Professor Pete and mm -hmm. uh, particularly Walter. Yes, well, you probably have more um, experience with FIFA and the like than I have. I'm, I came to this very recently, and I'm not a football expert myself. I'm not even a fan. That's probably the speciality. I could be, <laughs> I could be very distanced. <laughs> I don't care much about this game. I like other games more. Now, the, the point is, um, I think I see it more optimistically because I um, see that I think your analysis is right. There's a patronage network, 
money has been systematically used and dispensed to curry favor, to build allegiances. That's our problem. I think the analysis there we see very much eye to eye. The, the difficulty is how do you change this? And there's, a, I think in the past, there's been a strong sense of frustration, especially in a group like this here, because all of us basically had no chance of ac accessing these organizations. I think it's interesting that you have um, at least uh, the media boss of FIFA present here at all. You have somebody to talk to. Now, getting into the organization, I, why I'm more optimistic is because I've seen not only that you have these new people who are independent have specific roles, we have to be careful, they do not regulate FIFA as such. They have a, speci a specific job to do. So the ethics code does not decide on who gets, whether Qatar is upheld or not. That's something the, the ethics committee has a different job. It has to look if um, somebody, something has be gone wrong there. Um, what I do see though is that you have in the center of power a change. You have people leaving and new people coming in. And amongst those new people, I've been relatively careful saying not all of them, but um, a, a substantial figure are of a new extraction, a new type of people. And then if you look at home, I mean your own association, and you think of uh, associations that um, probably have a similar attitude, you could get easily about 25 associations out of the 209 to form a group of let's say, I wouldn't call them rebels, I would say a group that is really interested in change instead of just um, following uh, what, what, what the leader says. There I think, you know, we have to also look at the constituency, also look at the people that uh, you are familiar with at home and, say and put them <coughs> on notice. We expect that you, the associations, um, take your share of the responsibility. Well, if I, if I can uh, add uh, something, of course, uh, Monita, you're, you're right. Uh, this is a, a main topic that is discussed uh, now uh, in FIFA. And um, as you know, the compliance uh, system that is in place, or and uh, audit and compliance especially, they will look, look uh, into uh, those uh, into this money. Um, I don't know. Uh, how good and how how secure then uh, you, you can you can make this, but uh, um, I, I cannot talk about what happened in the last uh, 35 uh, years. But what I can say is that, um, in my point of view, there is a misconception because every time when you give money to association, let's talk about the gold project, 500,000 US dollars, and so on and so on, people suddenly think, well, it's only because uh, you want to secure your vote. Maybe this is also a factor. Maybe it's the main factor. But uh, my question is, what is the alternative? Every time, and not only when you talk about football, uh, uh, development uh, projects uh, on a governmental uh, um, a level, every time you go into a country and you support them, there are the basic discussion, is that good or not for the country? Is it good or not uh, to give them the money and uh, 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 not give them the chances to solve their own problems? So every time when FIFA goes to a country, they finance a gold project, suddenly in the room there is, oh, that's only because they want to secure the, the, the power. Maybe it's this, I don't know. But at the same time, the money that is invested in the countries, this is concrete money, concrete help for the people. And uh, uh, the, the, the only solution would be, okay, we don't spend the money uh, for the association, as you know, 75, 70 or 75 percent of of the of the um, of the earnings is going back to uh, to football to all those associations. So this is a, a, a slightly complicated uh, uh, discussion. Ha what what is the best way to do? Even if I agree that uh, yes, this is uh, an opportunity for people if they want to try to uh, to uh, not only secure uh, power but maybe uh, make money uh, for their own business. But uh, for the moment, I don't uh, see any alternative uh, unless uh, to have a very strong and very concrete uh, uh, compliance system 
uh, to control uh, those kind of uh, money flow uh, to all those countries. And we are in the process to do that. Okay, um, can you give the microphone to Andrew Jennings, please? Andrew Jennings from various places. And, uh, <laughs> um, I was interested in Walter's high opinion of Michael Garcia. I'd like you to explain something to me. It's widely known that Michael Garcia conducted an investigation into the ISL bribery scandal. Remember, 100 million US dollars from ISL to leading FIFA figures. We ha I have the documents, I've put them on BBC television. Garcia comes in, conducts an investigation, and we understand interrogated Set Blatter about the way he handled that bribe of March the 3rd, 1997, which went by accident through FIFA on its way to Havelange. Uh, Hildebrand documented it, we at the BBC have been documenting it for years. He does that investigation, and we're not allowed to see the report. Can we please know why, in this new era of transparency, we're not allowed to read the uh, interrogation of Michael Garcia of Set Blatter? Because I can go to any court in the world and sit there as a journalist or as a citizen and hear the evidence presented. I want to know why that evidence has been suppressed. <coughs> Second question, very quickly again, because there isn't an answer to my first question. The second question is, <laughs> for more than three <laughs> years, the FBI have been very seriously investigating FIFA. They have two uh, cooperating witnesses from within FIFA who have vast amounts of knowledge about uh, the endemic forever corruption inside FIFA. Has anybody on the platform spoken to them? Uh, I've met the Department of Justice. I've met this organized crime squad from Federal Plaza in New York. And as I say, they have two witnesses who rather than go to jail are, are giving them evidence <coughs> on bank accounts <coughs> and bribes. And I wonder if any of you have spoken to them. Thank you. Or have they spoken to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were right uh, on your first uh, question. I don't have an answer. Uh, I don't know why. And uh, I don't know, uh, uh, and, uh, and therefore I ask uh, the, the experts if this uh, uh, common standard to look in uh, those protocols. I don't know. I know that uh, Michael Garcia is not only uh, talking to uh, Sepp Blatter, he is still on the road, I don't know where now, to, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, to, uh, to see if he has uh, uh, proofs and evidence of um, a lot of things. Uh, but um, first of all, it's not my decision. I don't know, maybe it would be good to look into those documents. But uh, I don't know, is that uh, common sense? Is that, is that uh, a standard? I'll cite as an, an example the reason decision by the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. So if you want an example of a best practice of an internal organization that releases all of its interviews, all of its data, yes, yeah, some names were redacted, but that would be a good model for FIFA to adopt with its investigation. Yeah, but, you know, the problem is <coughs> you, I think you need uh, an answer from an expert. And the, exp the legal situation is that you have two reference points. You have either got... Uh, the administrative um, courts, uh, and that's what it is really, it's, it's kind of a, it's even a private uh, administrative arrangement. And the other point of reference would be a criminal trial. If you really go for the criminal side, and that's, there is an analogy there because the, the consequences are rather rough. Um, there is in every, and you're a representative of the world. In every country in the world, there is a pre-trial phase and there's a trial phase. And what you, can, uh, uh, what you can assist in as a journalist is the trial. You're never there in the pre-trial phase. In the French-speaking world, it's called secret de l'instruction. It's absolutely clear that when you prepare the instrument, when you actually investigate, and that's not just in the uh, continental European world, it's also in the Anglo-Saxon world, that part of the trial is never public. That's not something that is done in public because you're actually preparing for trial. Okay, so these kinds of interviews, imagine for instance, they're not taking you to Russia at the moment to go and interview people alongside, they're doing that in order to prepare a file. And that's the tricky thing, you actually have a first phase, you have an investigation, and the, what comes out of the investigation sees the daylight in, in a criminal setting 
in um, an act of accusation that then goes to trial. That's the analogy. And there you have, well, you've seen the report that's come out in the end. Mr. Eckert's report is the one that was published. Now, the question is, you, um, I can understand, and you see that even the media representative of the organization says, well, it would be a good idea to have everything public. But uh, as a lawyer, you would never, never, never publish everything. Otherwise, you would be absolutely ineffective. It wouldn't work. Nobody would speak to you. And I, don't, I wonder why you want things from an organization that go beyond what you at home demand from your state. That's the point. You have to ask for a moment, why are you um, more rigorous with such an organization than with states? Here, um, and here I must really say, you have a problem because, um, you know, I can understand that you have a gut feeling, but you have to have a little bit of expertise to understand these things. Yes, yeah, let me just weigh in also. Um, <coughs> an another professor gives an opinion. I, I think that if you look at CAS decisions, you look at the FA, you look at USADA, um, there are any countless numbers of examples of where there's uh, a, a higher level of transparency than you see with the ISL report. Um, yes, there's some legal considerations, but, uh, but if, if FIFA doesn't live up to the disclosure standards of CAS, which operates in the same country, then it, it certainly has a problem. Uh, question from the gentleman over there, please. Uh, yes, okay, yes. Uh, can, uh, okay, you can give the microphone to him, but. Well, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't talk to them. I don't know. Uh, can you mention them? You just yeah, said yeah. two. Uh, maybe you can address the question. Oh, no, no. I didn't. Uh, hopefully. If it will be like this in the past, in the future as well. <laughs> <laughs> well ho hopefully, hopefully, I don't think that they will ask anything uh, from I me. I think if uh, Andrew reads our first report that we came out with, you see there that this was one of the points why we felt not enough had been done in the past. That was the reason to create a new structure. The structure itself then, of course, had to take over. So Garcia's, it was Garcia's job to speak to the FBI, not ours. I think you also m have to be careful. Um, the there's separation of power. So Walter is the wrong person. He's not allowed to know anything. Um, myself, um, I'm not uh, 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 the judge of, uh, of second instance here. Garcia has to do his job. My, my point was to put them in place as a structure and see to it that it works. Now you can criticize whether their work is good enough, uh, that's fine. But what I can assure you is that we st if you read our report number one, uh, we say, well, there, were, there was evidence here that should have, been a should have been further followed up. We were not convinced by what they did in the past. That's why we need a new structure. That's what you can read. Mm. Yeah, the FBI was part of it. You just read our first report. Okay, yes. <coughs> Is this working for me? A question for Walter, uh, Nick Harris from the Mail on Sunday in London. A uh, two-part question. First one, you talked about the major mistake of the 2018 and 22 process, which everyone's acknowledged as a major mistake. So the first question is, why don't you simply undo that massive mistake? And the second question, after the last Exco meeting, or at the last Exco meeting, Sepp Blatter said unequivocally the 2022 World Cup would be in Qatar. He was also asked, was that not prejudging Michael Garcia's investigation? I.e., if he was already saying unequivocally it would be in Qatar, does it not completely prejudge Garcia's findings? Could you clarify once and for all whether Garcia's investigation has the potential to reverse that decision? Well, first of all, it's not uh, uh, Michael Garcia who, who's making the decision. It will be uh, echoed based on what uh, Garcia finds out. So I, I don't know uh, uh, what the president said is for a moment that that's uh, uh, what is uh, um, what was decided, and uh, we're talking only uh, only. <laughs> it's a major issue <laughs> to change uh, uh, the World Cup uh, from from summer to to winter. Uh, we we cannot speculate what will happen in the f in the future. So uh, let's let's wait. What uh, what is the outcome of? Uh, of uh, Garcia's uh, uh, files and uh, and then see what uh, what Eckert is doing with that. 
the first part, um, just to, um, to make it clear, the mistake is not to award the World Cup to Qatar. So it's not like, oh, uh, it has to be, um, I don't know, uh, England or, or Russia or US or, no, sorry, uh, Russia, US, uh, Australia. It's not, the mistake is not who won the bid, but uh, the process that uh, having two in the same time, uh, um, first of all, <laughs> and you don't, you don't care about that, but for us an administration is a, a huge uh, workload uh, that we never faced before because we have to deal with three different World Cups in the same time. You can imagine what this means and not easy ones. Um, but uh, I think that the, the problem uh, there was uh, uh, that if you have uh, two uh, um, World Cups to, to award, Suddenly, and that's what uh, what was said is uh, that uh, you you make some uh, you might make some deals. I give you the vote for for this, and you give me the vote for that, and so on and so on. And uh, and he was uh, for sure referring uh, to that, but I cannot uh, say what uh, what really it, uh, he said in detail. But the fact the fact itself to do that in the same time that was a major mistake. And uh, of course, now you ask uh, why why did the president uh, at this congress I mentioned when he was re-elected um, to decide to give the floor to the Congress and to back him uh, for his idea, namely to, uh, to bring the power from the Executive Committee to the Congress. Uh, <coughs> for sure to have a, a, a better, I don't know, a better uh, democratical uh, organ to, uh, to decide that, but you can in the same time imagine that not really everybody in the executive committee was happy with this decision. There were some uh, internal discussions that were not very, very easy to, uh, to support. And uh, this I is, yeah? I, th I think I would have to jump in here and say, in a way, we're barking up the wrong tree. Because, <coughs> you know, the tricky thing is, and you all know, in um, if, you want, if, you, if you want to um, build a bridge, and you ask for three, at least three valid um, uh, bids, it's relatively easy to have one good bid and two bad bids. So the real risk is that in the end, <coughs> the final stage, people will be confronted with, with, let's say, one bid that really flies and the rest is crap. Th the trick is how do you prevent that? And it starts off not at the exco level, it starts off within the in institution. And that's what they're doing at the moment. They're working on establishing criteria of how to really assess um, bids that come in so that it will be very difficult to say, to chuck out two or three in an early stage for political reasons. What you cannot do, and that's really the, ch the, the challenge, what you cannot do is you cannot um, carry through on a technical level to the bitter end. There is a point where politics come in. So what you can achieve is have the best possible situation for those who decide in the end by having three valid bids. And then the rest is a political issue. The question, where should it be in the world? Should it be more in Europe or more somewhere else? That is not a technical <laughs> issue. Uh, just uh, uh, Osasu, yes. it's yes. maybe it's not my, my, my role to, 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 to ask the question, but I, I really would like to, to uh, uh, come back on what you said. The president at the same press conference, he said something that was picked up, um, uh, was very critical, of course, bad uh, headlines. Uh, he said, uh, of course, you cannot avoid uh, political influence when you have uh, such such a bit. My question, and I was also asking uh, Prof uh, Professor Piet to, to, to have his opinion. <coughs> let's assume, let's assume, this is a, a purely academic debate, but let's assume that the head of state says to a member of the executive committee, listen, it would not be a disadvantage for our country, for our economy, if you would vote for this country. And after that, this country gets a two billion contract uh, for, uh, I don't know, to for railways or uh, technology and so on and so on and so on. So my question was, is this legal, is this illegal? A head of state, in my view, has, of course, to uh, protect the interest of a country, uh, the interest of, uh, I don't know, of the economy. Uh, you have a lot of uh, um, jobs to, uh, to, to create. So 
is this illegal or is this part of what the head of state uh, has to do? And then if this uh, exco members then decides, well, okay, I'm listening to, 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 to the head of state, but anyway, I was for, for this country. Is that already uh, corruption, like uh, intellectual corruption or not? I don't have an answer. I think it should be, it's a normal course, and that's what the president said, not only talking about uh, FIFA, IOC, just the big events. It's clearly, it's clear that the politics, the big powers, they have an interest on that. And, uh, and so uh, uh, rather to look into uh, who gave uh, an envelope to someone else, you should look into uh, who were the powers uh, behind uh, uh, this award and who will be the power uh, in future. And this would be my question if this is, is good. I don't know what, what you answered. Is, uh, is it in a gray zone, probably? You want me to answer? Well, yeah, are you yeah, directing yeah, absolutely. the question to him? Well, it's, it's bid rigging grand style. It's something that we encountered when we analyzed the, the UN Oil for Food uh, um, investigation, uh, the, the Oil for Food uh, program all the time. People, uh, countries were actually seeing to it that com uh, companies based in their country got jobs. That's very normal and if you, um, we're very nasty with companies that bribe to get a job. However, if President Obama flies to China and takes along a lot of um, bosses of companies and opens doors for them, suddenly this is not corruption or bribery in a technical sense. This is something much bigger, big politics. And <coughs> I think that's what you mean with the gray zone. We're in a similar situation here. And last point, the, the, the ethics committee can do what it wants, but it has no access to heads of state. <laughs> Not here. Um, just before I take a, a question, um, what has really bothered me with um, World Cup bids are that the technical reports are never regarded as sacrosanct. Because you would have thought that if you're giving people um, the rights or that they are interested in hosting a World Cup, you have a checklist. These are the minimum things that they must have before you have a vote. You do an inspection of the bidding countries. They either meet or they don't meet the technical requirements. So as you said, you can chop off a certain number of countries who don't meet those requirements. So as many that would go to the final vote, mm -hmm. even if it is a political decision, you know that each and every one meets the technical requirements for the World Cup. Because I remember before um, the vote for the World Cup in 2010, when I was speaking to the former Asian Football Confederation president, Mohammed bin Hammam, and he told me plainly, he said, look, I mean, yes, they prepare a technical report, but I'm at liberty to, to take it seriously or not to take it seriously. And for me, that is an issue of great concern. <coughs> yeah, but uh, exactly the guy you mentioned, he's not there anymore. So with this kind of attitude, uh, probably it's, uh, it's a good as it's gone. But I agree, you have a technical report, but the technical report doesn't take in, cons in consideration uh, sport politics. It just says uh, uh, on a technical base if it's good or not. I mean, the, the, the decision to go to a, to a, a new region this is purely a political decision. It's not based on, on technical studies. And of course, I mean, uh, these are discussions that uh, we do internally. Uh, how important at the end of the day are technical reports? Uh, of course, uh, people that um, have another opinion on FIFA say, well, it's just, uh, just for the opinion, for the public opinion to do technical reports. And then they decide anyway what they're going to do. The question it's difficult. is, uh, what, can we do, what can we achieve by applying <coughs> uh, Roger's criteria? I think what you can ensure is that there is a first level where there's purely technical and that the technical stuff then is passed on and it is open. It is visible that you only have three technically good um, projects being promoted into the Exco. And then you see what happens. Obviously, there is politics coming in, but what you can achieve is that politics don't come in and get mixed up with the technical. That's the real challenge. Jens? Thanks, Anderson from Play the Game, for once not with a practical remark. Um, th there is one question uh, about this. Uh, we are still in the, this bidding uh, uh, area. One thing that, that has puzzled me a bit 
because uh, when the IOC was struck by a corruption scandal uh, in the late 90s, what they did was that they narrowed the field of decision makers in, or they had an, a procedure by which uh, 100 and something IOC members could no longer travel the world individual and get luxury uh, preferential treatment, let's call it that. Um, now, if there are no very, very tight procedures, and to, m to my knowledge there are no such procedures at all uh, linked to the uh, decision of letting 205 Congress members um, make their choice for a host of a World Cup, my question is, don't we just risk that corruption will be much more expensive and or if it is not corruption, then that big politics will be, well, even more intensified and as a consequence, a lot of public and private money will be thrown in at individual favors for FIFA members, etc. Yeah, so the point is, uh, well, I understand that <laughs> in order to uh, corrupt uh, 24 uh, extra members, and now you have to uh, corrupt 209 members. Yeah, I, I uh. if you don't have regulations, I mean, it was possible in the, in the good old days to influence 100 and something uh, IOC members. Mm -hmm. So they narrowed the decision uh, uh, procedures in at the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's logic when you see the, the very close ranks <coughs> of the exco that you want to expand this decision and democratize, democratize dem make it more democratic <laughs> in, in some <laughs> way. But, but, uh, but still, there could be a great risk of uh, if there's money enough at hand that this, this uh, is just used for crea creating an even more chaotic process. That's a risk, yeah, I agree. Can I, uh, can I just come in on uh, uh, something more technical here? I mean, there is <coughs> petty corruption and grand corruption. And what you are alluding to, um, heads of an association who uh, eventually will be the uh, decision body being invited to a nice place, being invited multiple times to this nice place, even though they've seen everything, and every time they come, they get a debit card and they can do shopping. That will cost you 40,000 per, 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 per person. That's what I would call petty corruption. And that is a problem. And it's, I think IOC was well advised to stop that kind of thing after Salt Lake City. Y you know, the, the gun and so on that Samaranj got, that, that kind of thing was not what we wanted. Um, we actually raised that in our page on page 12 in our first report. We said that's a point when you look at hosting. I'm much more concerned by s something that I would call grand corruption, the big corruption thing. And that was what they were thinking they were cutting down on. A voice that cost you at least a million um, or a, a, di a, di a, 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 a um, in, in, in the decision. So that, that was what they wanted to spread um, in a, in a broader sense. And here, of course, it is true that uh, if you have to bribe 209, that's uh, going to be more expensive and it's going to be um, less effective. I think all of this is besides the point. That's why I'm saying you're barking up the wrong tree. The choice of the technically right bid is your, is your delicate point. Watch the first part and watch what happens in the exco then. That's where the things is done. In Congress, you know, they ultimately, they no, they're not even able to discuss. It's, um, I've compared it once to the Chinese People's Congress. Yeah, just, just quickly, I would say that the challenge that Jens raises is, is fundamental to democratic governance, representative governance in any nation that has a parliament. Um, and there are well-established procedures for conflict of interest guidelines, for disclosure guidelines that um, FIFA could adopt w if it wanted to clean up or streamline the process. One thing that's not, rec and we're not going to redesign that on this stage or in this conversation today, one thing that, that has escaped this conversation is that more stringent standards of governance are to protect FIFA from the political world outside. Um, it, this is the big confusion that I have because adopting such standards would seem to be in the interest of the organization so that their spokesperson doesn't have to sit up here um, and defend not having those. Um, it seems patently obvious that FIFA is a much stronger organization in the context of national leaders awarding contracts um, if they adopt those uh, sort of governance mechanisms.
Kurt Wachter from Fair Play Austria. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. De De Gregorio is, is going to, uh, to your remark about racism. I think uh, the issue is, is high on the agenda once again after the abuse of, of Yaya Touré in Moscow that uh, black players should boycott the, the World Cup 2018. And, and I'm just a bit concerned about the approach uh, uh, which is taken by, by FIFA. I was myself involved in some of the meetings on, on combating racism, for example, 2001 at the Congress in, in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, Mr. Blatter said uh, football has the power to combat racism. Now we are in 2013 and, and even we have uh, comments from example uh, from the former FA president of England, uh, Mr. David Trisman, who said when he was uh <coughs> part of, of FIFA meetings that he received anti-Semitic remarks. He also said that uh, black members of, of uh, within uh, these meetings received remarks. And, and you, you said uh, your approach is that we are doing a lot, but uh, also the society has to, to step in. Is that the approach FIFA has taken? Well, first of all, that's nonsense. If, uh, with all due respect to Mr. Treisman, I don't know, maybe uh, he uh, experienced this single uh, thing you said, but then making out uh, the story and saying FIFA is a, is a, is a, a racist or anti-Semite, and so that's, uh, that's just unacceptable. Uh, I just tell you uh, what the reality is. In a FIFA, 400 people are working at the headquarter, uh, coming from 43 nations, 43 nations. I myself, I experienced raci racism in a very low level compared to others in the 60s, the Italians, as uh, a lot of foreigners in Switzerland, they were not uh, treated uh, as maybe they are treated now. Uh, as an ac academic, when before I started to, to, to join uh, journalism, uh, this was my main uh, topic, racism, anti-racism. I did my master thesis on anti-racism in the 30s. Uh, so uh, I know a few things about this uh, uh, in theory and in, uh, in practice. Talking and saying that FIFA is uh, it might be might be racist or uh, for me is just uh, just polemic. Uh, but uh, said that, um, what I wanted to say is yes, racism is a hot topic, and uh, not only to please uh, uh, the public opinion because it's more than just uh, about football. It's more than about football, and uh, we have a task force chaired by Jeffrey Webb. Uh, and uh, in the next couple of uh, weeks and months, hopefully, they will come up with uh, concrete proposals. There was a, uh, um, at, the, at the Congress in Mauritius, the Congress, uh, they um, accepted, um, uh, what is it, a memorandum of understanding, uh, what we have to do uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to fight this, uh, um, uh, this, um, th this devil, if you want to call it like this. But um, it's very complicated. Uh, let's be very concrete. The president stressed it uh, last week in, in, uh, in the UK on, on his uh, trip uh, to London, saying that uh, financial fees or um, playing without spectators in a stadium doesn't help, doesn't really help. You always will find someone who gives you money to pay uh, uh, the sanctions. What really helps and what really uh, is, is a way is if it hurts. It has to hurt. And uh, what does hurt is deducti deduction of points when you, uh, when you play or even expel uh, a team from a competition. But now the problem starts. Now the problem starts. How you make sure that uh, five stupid guys in a stadium that are booing uh, a, a black player are not uh, uh, manipulated? I mean, it's very easy to put uh, a small group on the other side of the stadium trying to provoke those kinds of incidents. So I don't know, and this is a, a, a tough job that Jeffrey Webb has, to find a way that it is not just uh, on an academic level to say, yes, we, we, we fight racism, we do that and this and that, but on a practical way, how are you going to do that? Can you, can, you, uh, can you expel, can you deduct points? Yes. And by the way, it was already foreseen in the statutes. It was not applied, but it was foreseen to deduct points. So I think, uh, of course, you always can do uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, to fight racism, but um, it will be very hard and very tough to, to, to find a solution. And uh, as powerful as FIFA might be, 
they're powerless without the support of everybody. That was actually my message uh, when I was talking about racism. Don't try to, uh, to focus only on the pitch and go home with a good conscience. Yeah, well, I, fight, uh, I fought uh, uh, racism on the pitch. And then you're at home and uh, you forget what you said uh, uh, in the public. So the fight against racism starts here with you, with us, and uh, ends hopefully uh, uh, in, in the pitch, but not the uh, inverse. Okay, I think it's important just before I take uh, another question, uh, some element of disclosure is needed from me because, I mean, I'm a member of the FIFA Anti-Racism Task Force and since May we have been discussing the issues. Um, with regards to what happened to Yaya Toure, it's clear that this was a UEFA Champions League match. It was the responsibility of UEFA to deal with this problem. Um, UEFA has a system on how to deal with it. The referee didn't deal with it as he was supposed to. There's an internal inquiry from UEFA. I'm really fascinated to know what the result will be. But there is no question about it that we've come to a point where sanctions need to be more severe. I think deduction of points and long stadium bans are necessary. This is my opinion. I mean, we have these discussions in, in the task force at the moment. I know that before the end of the year, we're going to meet again. And um, we, we will have to pursue this. And there is no question, in my opinion, that ahead of the 2018 World Cup in Russia, the issue of discrimination in this country has to be tackled, at least within football. What goes on out of football is not within FIFA's purview. But what goes on in the stadium, what goes on in football, these are issues that FIFA has to deal with. But not just FIFA, the confederations and also the national associations. Okay. Ezequiel. Well, Mr. De Gregorio, uh, Ezequiel Fernandez Murs from Argentina, La Nación. Uh, how is FIFA analyzing uh, the next World Cup? Uh, I would like to know because we, all of us know what is happening now in the streets of Brazil, and we have just eight months for the World Cup. Well, um, once again, I have two options. Or I tell you what I told you off the record, or uh, I tell you the, the, the clean version. Um, I prefer what I, I told you before. Um, it is a problem. It is a problem um, that we have to face. For me personally, of course, we're talking about uh, a lot of important <coughs> things, <coughs> what we were discussing today. We're talking about Qatar, we're talking about Russia, we're talking about uh, reforms and other things. But my personal, my personal concern is the ne next World Cup. It's the next World Cup. It's not the World Cup in 2022. And uh, yes, our, our, our goal is to deliver, to deliver the World Cup, no matter how. We have to deliver it. And uh, um, I, I'm, 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 I don't know what, what, what I have to think uh, about all the different informations uh, I get. If you talk uh, to, uh, to the government, and uh, you will have a chance tomorrow uh, on a panel, I think the, the, uh, the deputy minister should be here, or at least someone from, from the LOC from Brazil. If, if I hear, hear and read what, uh, for instance, also the Minister of Sports, Aldo Rebello said, is uh, he said uh, that he, he thinks that uh, it will be much, much calmer next year because the people understood uh, that they missed a great opportunity this year to promote their country, to promote their country and to, uh, to show uh, what, what Brazil has to offer more than just football. Uh, on the other side, I have uh, other informations that are slightly different. Uh, they say it will be uh, worse than what we experienced uh, this year in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, we have information that uh, the so-called black bloc uh, would try to stop a game. Um, they will not succeed, but uh, the, the price we have to pay is very high. It means that uh, going to the stadiums, maybe you will have three, four, five, six thousand police uh, and uh, soldiers <laughs> trying to secure the, 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 uh, uh, the stadium. That will be probably the price we have to pay. It's not uh, if this is true, we will not have uh, an atmosphere of of uh, of, uh, of a party of of uh, enjoying uh, to go to the World Cup. Uh, uh, as you know as well, there's another point that uh, three months after the World Cup, there are presidential elections. So of course, uh, the World Cup is a good uh, uh, moment to promote or to to attack. Uh, uh, the government who is uh, in office today. So there are a lot of things. And coming back to, uh, to the protests, I always said it, uh, uh, also personally, I understand the Brazilians 
I understand why they go on the street and say, we want to have better uh, education <coughs> system, better health system, we want to have this and that. Um, of course, FIFA then comes and uh, has, a, you know, uh, VIP lounges and uh, whatsoever. And uh, but um, when I was talking, and maybe I'm 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 not uh, not right, but there is this uh, the slogan "Padrao FIFA," "Padrao FIFA." It means FIFA standard. So basically, people they are not uh, against the stadiums, but they say when you spend billions for the stadiums, you want to have the same standard, and hospitals, at school, and so on. So I say, yes, you can have the World Cup and those stadiums, but please give us what we really need. So uh, it's difficult. It's a political situation that we, we, ca we cannot solve. We cannot solve. And uh, 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 President Dilma Rousseff, uh, she addressed uh, her country after the protest, saying that she's going to change a lot of things. It's not our call. I really hope that uh, at the end we will experience uh, a World Cup uh, uh, as we, we expected it, when uh, when uh, Brazil was uh, uh, awarded, because nobody uh, could expect a situation like that. Uh, and just to close, our our personal uh, uh, my personal fear was uh, uh, the delay of the stadiums. Uh, are they ready to uh, to have the infrastructure? Uh, have uh, are they ready to have the airports uh, uh, as it is needed? So we we had a lot of worst case scenario, but uh, we pretty much were surprised to have a, a situation. I don't. Thi I think that even the Brazilians, most of them, were surprised on what happened. So yes, if you ask me uh, uh, what I'm expecting for next year, um, let's put it this way: it will be probably the the major challenge uh, for us uh, uh, f for the last uh, last uh, years that, that that we had a major challenge. Joseph, any plans to ask one last question before we close from the gentleman at the back there? My name is Tim Walters. I'm an academic from Canada. Uh, my questions for, for uh, Usasu and Walter. Um, Mr. Pief mentioned earlier that there was grand corruption and little corruption. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not you might make the same argument about discrimination. I believe that FIFA is in some ways committed to uh, working to minimize discrimination. But I wonder whether or not there's perhaps too much emphasis placed on spectacular incidents like a bunch of idiots at a football match screaming abuse at uh, Yaya Torre. Um, and that prevents perhaps looking at different kinds of discrimination. For instance, the fact that, and this goes back to um, Walter's suggestion earlier that the, there's no problems with the idea of hosting, the decision to host the World Cup in Qatar. Um, as many of you know, Qatar essentially functions as a kind of, has discrimination built into its social structure. 88% of the population of Qatar essentially live like modern day slaves. I'm wondering whether the pair of you think that's an appropriate place to host a World Cup. Well, that's, um, that's a good point, yeah. That's a good point. Um, yesterday I was in another, another, another uh, conference on, on a panel and uh, the question was, uh, um, do the big major sports event uh, still have a future? And if yes, what kind of future? And one question uh, raised at that uh, panel was, uh, do we have to integrate human rights in the bid to have a, a minimum standard, saying if you don't uh, uh, guarantee a minimum standard, then uh, you're not allowed to bid for a World Cup? I mean, this is slightly a philosophical uh, question because uh, where, do you, where do you draw the line? Uh, for instance, U.S., Guantanamo, uh, is that, uh, uh, do you have to take that in consideration? Would be the U.S. Uh, a candidate or not? Would be Europe as a whole uh, be a candidate when you see uh, that uh, the European uh, politics, they cannot agree on a common sense uh, to fight the, the situation that happens now in the Mediterranean with all the Africans coming. They're dying dozens and dozens and dozens uh, every day because uh, the European uh, politicians, they cannot agree on what to do. So uh, uh, do you have to uh, take this in consideration? So my question is, where do you draw the line? Basically, I agree and, uh, uh, that uh, you have to have a minimal, uh, uh, minimum standard, uh, even uh, human uh, rights. But the, that's a good example, Qatar. I truly believe that Qatar in 10 years' time will be another country as we have now. 
And why? Because of the spotlight that gives the World Cup. This for me is not a contradiction. It is exactly when you talk about legacy. I don't think that uh, the, the Qataris uh, uh, were so stupid that they would ignore this fact that uh, once they have the, the World Cup, the world attention is focused on uh, this country. Maybe they make that's, that's something that triggers a change. And uh, there is a lot, and there are other people that know more about the Middle East in the room uh, to tell you that maybe it's also, uh, how do you say it in English, prejudice? Note uh, that we have towards some some uh, some countries. I think it's a great uh, cha uh, chance for uh, for uh, for Qatar not only to host the World Cup, but once again, if you allow, uh, I'm coming back what I said also uh, during my speech about hypocrisy. When you talk about human rights, there is a big factor of hypocrisy, because uh, you're expecting from football or from sports in general that they behave on a level that you're never asking for uh, governmental uh, institutions from your own country, from uh, economy. Uh, um, uh, Professor Piet just mentioned, uh, as an example, Obama going to China. I mean, you can question this as well. Why does he go to China? You know the situation in China. You know the situation in other countries. So why has football this duty that other people don't have? But in the, in the principle, I agree that this is something that we have to look into. I know we could go on and on, but time is not our friend. We have to end here, and the breakout sessions will be starting shortly. Thank you very much to the panel. I'm sure that uh, we will be having this conversation outside of here and uh, for many months and years ahead. Thank you very much, everyone.